Hi, everybody. So now let's um, look at what a group is defined to be from a formal point of view. And um, then we'll look at a few very simple examples and then subsequently look at a bunch more examples to see if we can get some kind of a feel for what these abstract objects really are. So um, a group, let's call it G, is a set. So that's the first, it, it consists, it has sort of two parts. The first part is that it's a set. And the second part is it has what's called a binary operation. And this combination, the set and the binary operation, have to satisfy certain properties. And we'll get to those properties in a minute. But before we do that, let's think about what we mean by a binary operation. Um, and actually, the book uses slightly different terminology. It calls a binary operation a law of composition, but it's the same thing. So what is a binary operation? Well, from a formal mathematical point of view, a binary operation on a set, G, could be group, could be any set, is just a function from the Cartesian product of the set with itself back to the set. So in other words, it's a function which takes as input a pair of elements of the set G and produces another element of the set G as output. Um, so if that were the whole story, maybe it would be pretty obvious what's going on. But, but actually, we, we make lives difficult on ourselves. Because when we talk about these kinds of binary operations, we don't tend to use standard function notation. So for example, when we talk about addition, we tend to write x plus y, which doesn't look like uh, a function. Let's say we're here talking about the integers. x plus y doesn't look like our usual notation for a function from z cross z to z. But it, it really is one. It's just written in a different way. So we could call we could make a function that we could call plus which has as its domain the cartesian product of the integers with itself or in other words pairs of integers and its codomain the integers and we would define this function by saying that plus of xy is just x plus y and this kind of circular definition shows you that even though we write x plus y differently from the way we would normally write a function it's still a binary operation and uh, in, in group theory and in other parts of mathematics, there's lots of symbols that we use in this way. So for instance, we might use um, the circle, like for composition of functions. We write, might, might write x circle y if x and y were functions, and that would mean the composition of x and y. But again, we could think of that as a function which takes two functions and produces a new one. Um, and so the book sometimes uses the circle to just mean some arbitrary binary operation. Or subtraction is a binary operation. We write a minus b is really the function f of a b is a minus b. So, um, and then of course, to further complicate our lives, sometimes we don't write anything for uh, the binary operation. We just write the symbols next to each other like we do with multiplication. So if x, we, we might write multiplication of x and y is just x, y, but implicitly there's a multiplication operation in there, and that's really a function of two variables which takes x and y as input and returns their product. So leaving aside all these questions of notation, basically a binary operation on a set is, an, is a function which takes two elements of the set in and produces a new element. Now, there are lots of binary operations on sets, and all to, some of them are much more interesting than others. So um, when we talk about the definition of a group, what we mean is that we have a set with a binary operation, but that that binary operation and the elements of the group have certain relations which add structure to the thing that we're studying. So in these definitions, I'm going to write my binary operation as if it was multiplication. So when I write x, y, this is the binary operation applied to the elements x and y. So the three 
axioms which define a group are the following. The first requirement is that the binary operation has to be associated. And what that means is that if you have three elements, x, y, and z in G, and you compute the binary operation on x and y first, and then take that and make it the apply z to it, it's the same as if you did y and z first, and then did x. And notice that I'm careful about the order here. If you were going to try to write this in terms of a function notation, then x and y together is the binary operation applied to x and y. And then you would take the binary operation applied to the binary operation applied to x and y and applying it to z. And that's supposed to be equal to what happens if you first do the binary operation on y and z and then do m on x and that. So you can see why this is a little bit more confusing than the way we usually write the associative law. And in some ways, the main significance of the associative law is that if I write an expression like x, y, z, then I, it has a well-defined value because it doesn't matter if I can... The binary operation means you can only multiply, so to speak, two elements at a time. So I, in order to evaluate this, I either have to first do y and z and then multiply that by x, or I have to multiply x and y and then multiply it by z in order for it to make sense. And the fact that the operation is associative means that you get the same answer either way. So that's the first axiom, that the binary operation is associative. The second axiom asserts the existence of an element in G, which is called an identity element. So it says that there is an element, which I'm going to call E, in the set G, which has the property that ex and xe are both equal to x for all x in g. So multiplying or applying the binary operation by e to x on either side gives you back x. And again, I'm careful about order here because one of the things which is missing from this list is the assumption that xy and yx are the same. So we'll come to that later, but for now I have to be careful because it isn't necessarily the case that yx is the same as xy, so I want to be sure here that ex and xe are both equal to x. And the third axiom is that every element of g has an inverse. And what that means is that no matter what x in g you pick, you can always find a y in g, which has the property that multiplying x by y on either side gives you back the identity element. So these are three properties. And the amazing thing is that these are enough to give you an en enormous theory because they have a kind of balanced property that on the one hand, they're general enough that there are lots of examples. But on the other hand, they're specific enough that it's still interesting to study these kinds of things. There's one additional uh, axiom which you can consider sometimes. And that has to do with this question about whether x times y and y times x are the same. So if it happens that the binary can operation satisfies the condition that xy equals yx for all pairs x and y and g, then the group has an extra property and it's called an abelian group. Otherwise, it's called a non-abelian group. So unless you're told specifically that the group is abelian, then you can't assume it, and you have to assume that, it, that, that for some pair x, y, it could happen that x, y is not the same as y, x. OK, let's look at some very simple examples. So maybe the most basic example of all is that the set of integers with addition is a group. So what does that say? It says that if you take three integers and look at addition, it has to be associative. Now, just as a remark, if you look back at the axioms, here I wrote the operation as multiplication, and so I wrote the, um, the associative law multiplicatively. For the integers with addition, I'm going to use the usual addition symbol, and so I have to write 
the associative law additively, um, but it's the same law. It's just that here I'm writing the binary operation with a plus sign instead of thinking of it as multiplication. The second axiom we need to check is that there is an identity element so that x plus e and e plus x are x for all x in z. And the identity element is the zero element because it is in fact the case that zero plus x equals x plus zero equals x for all x in z. And the third property is that if a is an integer, there is a b in z so that a plus b equals the identity element, which is, is of course, zero, and that's also equal to b plus a. And that's true. The inverse, b, is minus a, which is also an integer. And it is the case that a plus minus a is minus a plus a is zero for any a in z. And these three things tell us that z together with addition is a group. And in fact, because a plus b equals b plus a for all a and b in z, z is an abelian group. The word abelian comes from the name of a mathematician named Niels Abel, who was one of the people who really invented group theory. And so his name, actually his name is pronounced Abel, but in English we've turned it into abelian, abelian group. Now, there are two other examples that are very similar to the integers, and that's what happens if you allow the set of rational numbers under addition and this set of real numbers under addition. And in each case, those are still groups. And in some sense, the proof is exactly the same. Namely, for the rational numbers, it's the case that if that zero is in the rational numbers, well, addition is still associative. There is still an identity element. If a is a rational number, so is minus a. And so, and also a plus b is b plus a for a and b in the rational numbers. So it's the case that the rational numbers are also an abelian group. And of course, the real numbers are two. I won't go through the argument, but it's basically the assertion that if you have a real number, it's negative is still a real number, that addition is associative, and that zero is a real number. But there's some more interesting examples that we've also already seen. One is the case that the integers mod n with addition are a group. So here n is any integer, positive integer. And here we're making, let's just check what the uh, assumptions are. The first is that if we have a plus b plus c, is that in fact equal to a plus b plus c, where a, b, and C are all congruence classes in Z mod NZ. And this is true because by definition, A plus B plus C is A plus B plus C, which is A plus B plus C, and now we use the fact that 
addition for integers is commutative because a, b, and c are representatives of the congruence classes. They're just integers. So that's equal to a plus b plus c, which in turn is a plus b plus c, which in turn is a plus b plus c which is maybe a long and rather tedious assertion of what we already know, which is that addition of congruence classes in the integers mod n is an associative operation. Next, we need to be sure that there's an identity element, and we know what the identity element is. Zero is the identity, the congruence class of zero, because a plus zero is same as the class of a plus zero, which is the class of a. And that's the same as the class of zero plus a. And we know that there are inverses because the inverse of an element is the class of its negative. So, I mean, if you want to be completely explicit, if n were, let's say, 11, then if we took, uh, let's say, 5, the congruence class of 5, its inverse, on the one hand, we might think of as the congruence class of 6, or we might, but, but that's the same, 6 is the same as the congruence class of minus 5, because 6 is congruent to minus 5 mod 11. So, and finally, because this addition operation is commutative, a plus b is b plus a, they're both equal to the class of a plus b. This is also an abelian group. and it has n elements. And for our final example in this first set, the collection of symmetries of an equilateral triangle, which we discussed earlier, also form a group. And this is maybe our most, our first uh, illustration of how groups include things which are a little bit more unusual. So we need to remember that a symmetry of the triangle is a function that takes the triangle to itself by a rigid motion. And if you'll recall, we saw that there were, there's the, uh, that the possible elements are the identity, the left rotation by 120 degrees, the right rotation by 120 degrees, and three reflections. That gives us the six elements of the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. And the operation, the binary operation, is composition. So I think these were called the identity. This, I think, was called row 2. This was called row 1. And the reflections were called mu 1, mu 2, and mu 3. So the way you multiplied, or the binary operation on these uh, symmetries, was the operation of composition. So for instance, you could look at row 2, row 1, means first do row 1, then row 2. So it's composition of functions. Now, to check that this is a group, we first of all need to know that composition is associative. In other words, suppose we have A, B, and C, all functions from T to T and we compute the composition of A composed with B, and we compose it with C, and we want to know, is that the same as the composition of A 
with B composed with C. So this one means you do C first here, you do C first, and then you take B and A, A and B and combine them, and you do that next. And this means first you do B composed with C first, and then you do A to the result of that. But it's a general fact that composition of functions is associative, and that follows from the definition. If X is in T, then A composed with B composed with C applied to X. So X might be a, is a vertex of the triangle. We want to know where does that vertex go? Well, the answer is you first take C of X, and then you apply A composed with B to it, and that means you're going to apply A of B of C of X. So you first do C, and then you do A composed with B, but how do you do A composed with B? You first apply B to C of X, and then you apply A to that. And if you did it the other way, that would mean you first do B composed with C, so you would compute B of C of X, and then you would take A of that. And you see that these two things are actually equal. This was actually covered in 2710, so if you've forgotten about associativity, you might want to go back and look at the 2710 notes about associativity, of, about how composition of functions works. But in general, both of these things mean the same thing. They mean first do C, then do B, then do A. First do C, then do B, then do A to X. And uh, so therefore, they define the same function. What about the identity element? Well, the identity element is the identity function. It's the function e from t to t, which takes the triangle and just leaves it alone. And if you think about composition, if, if A is any symmetry, then A composed with E First, the E does nothing, it leaves the triangle alone, and then A does it. So this is the same as the map from T to T, just A. And similarly, if you do E first followed by A, you get A from T to T, because here what happens is first you do A, and then you leave everything alone. So the symmetry which takes the triangle and just leaves it in place acts like an identity element. What about inverses? Well, there are two ways you could go about this. The first is you could use the fact that symmetries are bijective. So method one. And if you remember from 2710, we have the inverse function theorem, which says that if f from A to A is bijective. So this is the inverse function theorem from 2710. Then there exists G from A to A, so that F composed with G is G composed with F is the identity map on A. So the fact that the symmetries are bijective, and they're bijective because there's three vertices and it just rearranges them, so it's one-to-one -one and onto from the three vertices to the three vertices, um, you automatically know that you have a function g, which, since composition is the binary operation, this is, so to speak, f times g, and this is g times f, and we've already seen that the identity map is the identity element in this group. Method two, though, is just to look at the things. I mean, so we have the identity, uh, we have six symmetries. We have the identity and its inverse is the identity itself because the identity composed with the identity is the identity. You have the left rotation where you turn the triangle one step to the left its inverse is pretty clearly the right rotation where you turn 
the triangle one step to the right. And similarly, if you turn the triangle one step to the right, and then you do the left rotation, and you turn it one step to the left, it ends up back where it started. And finally, you have the reflections. And they have the property that if you do them twice, they come back to where they started one. So the inverse of mu1, mu2, and mu3 are themselves. Because if you do, for instance, mu2 composed with mu2, you get the identity map because what you've done here is you've flipped the triangle around this axis. First you flip it, and then you flip it back. And the combination of those two things is the identity. So you can see that every element here has an inverse just by working through the elements and figuring out what their inverses are. The method that we just used involving uh, the, uh, you know, this right here where we actually worked it out, I mean, that is limited because here we're lucky we have a, only six elements. In more complicated situations, we may need to use some theory. The theoretical uh, proof here is nice, but it doesn't actually tell you what the inverse is necessarily, right? I mean, here it tells you that each of these things has an inverse, but not necessarily what it is. Whereas in this calculation here, we actually figured out exactly what the inverse of each of our elements is. We're going to look at some more examples uh, in the next uh, video.